Thank you very much. And thank those of you who are taking time from your busy schedules, your family, your practices to sit in on this um, very um, forefront in learning where you have the opportunity to ask questions and I'll try to be sure I answer them for you. When we're talking about periodontal treatment, I think that what I'm going to be able to show you in this next hour is a way that you can finally overcome the problems that we've had in the past. Now, before we begin, you need to know a couple of disclaimers. I invented the FDA cleared uh, Paraprotect method with Paratrays and I'm the majority owner of it. I think that means you should listen with a jaundiced ear. I will try and tell you only those things that are factual. If uh, you have any questions, those please ask. What I hope to discuss in here are the differences between acute and chronic wounds, how that applies to periodontal disease, how there are guidelines already for those uh, as far as treating chronic wounds, and when you begin to understand that, I think you'll get a better idea of different methodologies for practice. Now, all journeys start with a guide. And the guide that started me along this pathway with uh, understanding periodontal disease was Dr. Bill Costerton. Bill was doing some research for us. And one day I got a phone call from him. He asked me if he, if he would if I would give him a call because there was a problem with some of the research. I said, sure, no problem. So I called him that night. They had received some of our samples that we were taking from periodontal pockets and putting them in sterile containers and shipping them and then to, this was Allegheny Singer Hospital at that time. They were also doing some uh, wound treatment um, evaluations for South Earth Regional Wound Care Center. And the problem was, we were using the same type of collection uh, apparatus, and they just happened to drop our samples onto the same tray with Southwest Regional Wound Center, and there wasn't a way to know which ones came from where. So Bill said we didn't think it'd be a problem because what we were going to do was we would run these through a DNA sequencer. We would know which bacteria were the oral bacteria and which bacteria came from the diabetic wounds. There was just one problem when they ran them through the sequencer. They were the same bacteria. You see, what we've learned is there's not an oral biofilm and a systemic biofilm. They're the same. The same bacteria that we are seeing in periodontal disease are the same community that the medical profession is treating uh, in whatever realm they're doing. There's just one family of bacteria, 700 to 1,000 different types, that end up infecting or affecting the host. And this has also been evaluated. West Virginia Biofilm Research Laboratory basically says the same thing. There is no such thing as a dental microbial biofilm. We came up with that man-made term to explain the concept, but the truth is it is one biofilm that affects us as humans. So if that's the case, if the bacteria we see in periodontal disease are the same bacteria that the physicians see in their wound care, acute or chronic wound care, then why shouldn't we dentists go to physicians who've been treating chronic wounds longer than we have and learn from them. That's exactly what I did. I went down to the Southwest Regional Wound Center. Um, this is run by a Dr. Randy Walcott. His brother Rick was doing the laboratory work for them. And I began to study with them how the medical profession was treating chronic wounds. Now, one of the things that they were utilizing that I noticed when I walked into their clinic was they were using oxygen as a means for treating these chronic wounds. And they were using oxygen in the form of hyperbaric oxygen or hyperbaric oxygen containers you see here. And what they would do is they would take and they would apply about five atmospheres of pressure 
inside this hyperbaric chamber so that the 18 to 20 percent oxygen in the environment would be close to 100 percent oxygen now works great there is a ton of research that shows oxygen under pressure is a fabulous wound cleaning and, and wound cleansing medicament so therefore if this is what the physicians are doing what we're looking to do was find the same way to take this concept and apply it to dental now we in the dental profession are probably dealing with the world's largest wound if you look at the volume of it um, more people have periodontal disease than have just about any other type of chronic wound now why haven't we then been able to control periodontal disease and or the oral systemic connection with it well the primary reason was we have not been able to successfully manage the methods of treatment because the methods of treatment you and I learned in school are acute disease modalities, and we're using them for chronic wounds. Now, this became real poignant in a program I was sitting in a couple of years ago. It was this, uh, there's the American Association for Wound Care. And I was sitting in the, the lecture hall, listening to one of the lectures, and he made the statement that, you can't treat a chronic wound with, a, with acute treatments because when you do that, you are destined to fail. And for me, this was the epiphany. This was the light bulb going off. This was, oh my gosh, it's no wonder we've been unsuccessful. We learned acute disease treatments and we've been applying those. I mean, I've been in dentistry for over 40 years. I've been doing this with what I was taught, but it's not the method that's going to work. So let me help you understand the differences between acute and chronic wounds so you can better appreciate how we can utilize the guidelines for chronic wound treatment for the chronic wound we are treating periodontal disease. Now, what's an acute wound? This is an acute wound. You get a splinter in your finger, that's an acute wound. Now, if you are not really familiar with this terminology, Dimit over rice, and I'll leave this article up for you a little bit. You can you can just Google Dimit over rice, and uh, it's it's about wound healing pathophysiology. This is probably one of the best articles if you're not really familiar with these differences to look at and begin to get a better understanding. What this article is going to talk to you about is the difference between acute and chronic wounds. What happens with an acute wound as a splinter enters the epidermis of your hand, bacteria are gonna be on that splinter. And the first thing we need to understand is the scope and magnitude of bacteria. We have no concept of the size. If you have a ballpoint pen, if you look at the ball of that ballpoint pen, you can put between 1 million and 10 million bacteria on the head of that ballpoint pen. They're everywhere. They're all over our entire body. We think of bacteria as the enemy. They're not. Without bacteria, you and I are dead. They're what allow us to digest our food. They're what allow us to take in vitamin D. Without them, we're not gonna make it very far. But let's talk about acute wounds. You're going to get some of these bacteria in here that are going to be pathogenic. Now, what happens with the acute wound is you trigger your mast cells to release histamines, and then this starts what's called a protein cascade, which is the formation of proteins, uh, chemokines and cytokines, of which there are two types. There are types that call in the other white blood cells, and then there are types that cause inflammatory changes that are usually activated by the white blood cells. So here we get a release of the histamine granules. The first thing that's gonna happen, these are calling in the other defense cells. So the capillaries are going to begin to expand and the spaces between the cells begin to open up and your polymorphonuclear leukocytes then can come out of the capillary and run smack into a human cell and there's no way around it. It can't get to 
the wound because there are these human cells that are in the way. So the second part of this protein cascade is then these polymorph nucleolucocytes will release um, chemokines, cytokines, other, other medicaments, other proteins, let's say, where they can then begin to release the bonding between the human cells so they can now squeeze between the human cells. Uh, your matrix metalloproteinases, of which there are a whole host of these, these are the primary ones that, that are in, in usage. Then these polymorph nucleolucocytes, your white blood cells, can go migrate up to wherever the wound is. They begin to phagocytize the bacteria. Then they are engulfed by macrophages or monocytes so that they take care of these white blood cells that are full of bacteria. And once you get rid of all the bacteria, then the tissues have a chance to heal. And this is acute wound treatment. And what happens then is your wound heals. You get your little clot, your fibrin, tissues go over, you get a, a basic healing of all the tissue. This is not what happens in periodontal disease. We get stuck in a chronic stage of inflammatory disease because we do not get rid of the bacteria. You can almost think of this as the bottom of that splinter gets broken off, and in that bottom of the splinter is just a whole host of bacteria that just keep reforming. If you don't get rid of the cause, it cannot heal. And that's what happens with a chronic wound. But now what occurs is that protein cascade that allows your polymorph nucleolucocytes to migrate up to the wound, if that wound is not totally eradicated, if you don't get rid of all the bacteria, and we do not in periodontal disease, then you continue to form these proteins, matrix metalloproteinases, histamines, et cetera, chemokines, cytokines, of which there's a whole host, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha, however many you want to talk about, that will keep an inflammatory response, we call it swollen gums, because what happens is that tissue continues to be reacted by those proteins that the white blood cells make. So if we don't clear that up, what we have is we elevate the chemokines and cytokines levels, and that increases the tissue inflammation and the edema, and we have red swollen gums because all these elevated matrix metalloproteinases, et cetera, continue this edema process where you end up with venous hypertension, fluid accumulation, fibrin buildup, and you now have a chronic periodontal condition. This is why we haven't been able to correctly eradicate periodontal disease because wound debridement, which is what scaling and root, and root planing is, is just one part of the steps that are necessary to treat chronic wounds. Scaling and root planing does not remove all of the bacteria. And what happens is that 47% of our patients have periodontal disease, they have a shared frustration because they go through what you and I have been taught to do mechanically try and remove these deposits and you cannot do it. Plus, they regenerate. If we take a look at some of TELUS work where they took denture teeth and natural teeth and they removed mechanically all of the bacteria they possibly could, then put it back into an oral environment. In 48 hours, all the bacteria had regenerated to the pre-treatment level. So they regenerate so fast once you disturb them it is a never-ending battle if we continue to do what we have been doing, which is try to treat these mechanically. If you treat them mechanically, what happens is the, the subgingival biofilm before and after treatment are exactly the same. All, if you leave 
those etiological agents there, all they have to do is regenerate or recolonize to pretreatment levels, and you're back with the same problem. <clears throat> now, part of the next thing we need to understand is there are differences in the different types of bacteria that are present. There are some bacteria that you find in healthy gum tissue. Those are going to be more of your aerobic gram-positive bacteria. And there are going to be bacteria that are more present in disease states. And those are going to be more of your gram-negative obligate anaerobes. So one of the things we have to understand is how do we begin to control these different bacteria? Well, let me show you why scaling and or root planing is not going to be the answer for you. Lou's work showed that if you have a microbiome and you scale it or root plane it, what's going to happen is you are going to, you're going to decrease these three groups of bacteria, gram-negative obligate anaerobes, your gram-negative facultative anaerobes, and your aerobic bacteria. If with scaling and root plane, you will decrease those, but what happens is they immediately begin to regrow, but they regrow in a different factor than they disappear. What happens is within six weeks, your gram-negative obligate anaerobes grow the fastest, followed by your gram-negative facultative anaerobes and your aerobic bacteria actually decrease in population. So those bacteria that cause the most damage are going to be the bacteria that regenerate with six weeks after scaling and or root planting. Therefore, some people have advocated that we use antibiotics as a part of the methodology to control this reinfection or the reservoir bacteria that, that reside. The only problem with that is bacteria, because they can intercommunicate so well, have developed a resistance to or a tolerance to the antibiotics. And that's why we're having more and more resistant strains of bacteria. Case in point, surgery, scaling, root planing, pocket probing, uh, periapical surgery, modified flaps, citric acid lavage, chlorhexidine rinses, uh, every three months you're getting a prophylaxis. I mean, you can't do much more than that uh, from a dental standpoint. But you know what? It didn't affect the prevalence of the target species a one year post-treatment. The pathogens, if they are there, you have left the splinter in the wound. You are not dealing with an acute wound. You're dealing with a chronic wound. So how do we treat chronic wounds? Well, we go back to the medical profession. They have a whole book on how you treat chronic wounds. And you can find this. It's a, the part of the AMA. It's part of the Wound Healing Society guidelines. These guidelines basically say these are the steps that need to be taken to manage chronic wounds. Step number one, you have to control the cause of disease. You have to use either topical antimicrobials, hyperbaric oxygen, or adjunctive medications. These can be antiseptics. That would also include antibiotics if you need them. The second phase is then you clean up the wound bed itself, wound debridement. We call it scaling and or root planing surgery, periodontal surgery, and also compression bandages. And then you prevent this from reoccurring. Well, the American Dental Association also has guidelines for chronic wound care. These were found in the American Dental Association uh, periodontal guidelines, Academy of Periodontics in the Journal of Periodontology 2000. What they're talking about is specifically doing these steps. Alter or eliminate the etiology, arrest the progression of the disease, prevent reoccurrence, and augment reattachment or regeneration. If we combine the medical and dental guidelines for chronic wound care, the steps that are going to show up are going to be, number one, 
control the pathology, control the infective agents, arrest the progression, that's going to be your wound debridement, wound management, prevent reoccurrence, and augment regeneration. And specifically what I want to do is show you that these guidelines work. And by applying these guidelines and treating a chronic wound, you can now control a chronic wound. And that's what periodontal disease is. So this is what we're going to be looking to do. And how do we do it? One of the methodologies that we use is be able to change the microenvironment where the bacteria reside. So what we do with a custom formed direct medication device, we can deliver medicaments down into that gingival sulcus or periodontal pocket. And the medicament I'm going to recommend that you consider using is hydrogen peroxide because it breaks down to water and oxygen. There's nobody that's allergic to it and there's no bacterial resistance to oxidation therapy. Now, what we're looking to do then is to convert this microenvironment where the bacteria have taken over and are the infective agents. Because we are not able to get in there with the toothbrush far enough to control them, what the tray allows you to do is deliver medications that you cannot get to mechanically. And as a result, you can convert that environment from one that was conducive to disease to one that is now conducive to health and healing. And by your patients using these trays, maybe when they bathe or they shower, they can continue to control this microenvironment. So the bacteria that cause harm are controlled and the bacteria that you need there, your aerobic bacteria, are going to be the ones that remain. So that's how this system is going to allow you to help your patients control chronic wounds. Now, some of the research that has been done, chronic wound management of periodontal disease, this was back in 2017. What we were doing is we're using the AMA guidelines to manage etiology of disease. Then we're going to use a direct medication delivery, followed by scaling and a ruplane. The first thing we have to do is control the etiology. The second thing we do then is go in and remove the calculus tartar, et cetera, so that you then have an opportunity for a long-term management. Now, why hydrogen peroxide? What's its role in healing? Well, it breaks down to oxygen and water, and in the perio tray, it generates 5.3 times the normal saturation of oxygen, which is equitable to the oxygen level in hyperbaric chambers. It's antimicrobial. There are no bacteria that are resistant. To, to the being oxygenated. And especially in a hyperbaric environment, oxygen is a tremendous medicinal agent. So the benefits of hydrogen peroxide, well, one of the things is it's a wound debridement agent. So not only are you using it to control the etiology of disease, but you're also fulfilling the second step of the chronic wound guidelines, which is wound debridement. That's just the bubbling to get rid of the bacteria that are there. It disrupts the bacterial cell by inactivating the ox metabolism enzymes. This reduces your tissue inflammation, is specifically your interleukin-8, which is one of the chemokines that your white blood cells make in response to the, the bacterial cell walls. It also decreases your pro-inflammatory cytokines from your dendrites. And because it generates oxygen at a higher concentration at 5.7 atmospheres, you are getting the benefits of hyperbaric oxygen, but it is only localized delivery. You're not having to put the whole patient into a hyperbaric chamber. Hyperbaric oxygen is lethal to your anaerobes. These are the bacteria, the red, the orange complex that have been found to cause most of the damage. So that when you introduce oxygen, you eradicate these anaerobes within one to two days. It shifts then the predominant species from those that cause disease to bacteria that you can live in a symbiotic or commensal relationship with. And it also reduces the number of bacteria. In the research that was published back in 2017, it showed the number of bacteria was reduced by a negative log two to four. 
Uh, if you haven't done a lot of research, that probably doesn't mean much, but let's make it simple. A log two reduction is having 100,000 bacteria. A log two reduction means you go from 100,000 bacteria to 1,000. A log four reduction means you go from 100,000 bacteria down to 10. So hydrogen peroxide, just because of the nature of it, is able to do all of these things and with a tray to deliver this subgingival and interproximal, you can deliver this medicament to the source of the disease, convert a infected region to an area conducive to healing. And because hydrogen peroxide is natural, you are not introducing a foreign substance. You make hydrogen peroxide in your liver. You make hydrogen peroxide in all of your white blood cells. Uh, we make it in uh, human breast milk in the form of lactose peroxidate. We feed it to our newborns. And myeloperoxidase is part of the saliva chain reaction. So you are swallowing this every time you swallow. You're swallowing hydrogen peroxide. If you didn't have it, you'd be dead. So what we want to do now is understand how the hyperbaric concept now applies to dentistry in the form of the perio tray, because what you're doing is now delivering oxygen under pressure, subgingival and interproximal, and that's your main medicinal agent. So let me show you how this works. <clears throat> this was a gentleman who had been in to see his general dentist repeatedly. He'd had full mouth scaling for the prior 10 years. He actually uses hydrogen peroxide daily as an oral rinse. And that's going to be one of the questions you're going to get from a patient. Well, why don't I just rinse with it? Well, very simply, it won't go down into the crevice or the sulcus because you've got curricular flow that's going to basically flush it right back out. So this man, who's done everything he can think of, has gone to the dentist repeatedly, and the problem was he wasn't getting better. He was getting deeper pockets. You'll see the pocket around tooth number 15 in a minute. They wanted to take the tooth out, and he just wanted to know, did he have any other choices? <clears throat> so this is a gentleman. Obviously, this man goes to the dentist on a regular basis. His teeth are pretty immaculate. He has good dental work. He has a good occlusion. And he's got terrible periodontal problems. If you take a look, he has six, seven, eight, nine, ten millimeter pockets around his posterior teeth. And this is a man who's getting his teeth cleaned regularly. Why didn't it work? Because scaling, root planing, debridement, those are acute modalities if you do not control the cause of disease first. So what we're going to recommend, and this is the area up around tooth number 15, you can see the bone loss almost to the apex of the mesial buccal root. And this had a, about a grade three mobility in 10 plus millimeter pocket. Well, with direct medication delivery or the paratray utilization, the scope and magnitude of the disease determines the initial utilization. Now, doesn't mean this person's going to keep using these trays four times a day. This is just for the first or second week, so you can convert that infected region to a healthier region. Then as the tissues begin to heal, then you can go from four times a day to three times a day to twice a day to once or twice a day. And you're going to modify that as the healing occurs. So in this case, where we've got 10 plus millimeter pockets, we're going to start the gentleman using the hydrogen peroxide four times a day. We'll see him in two weeks. That 10 millimeter pocket's probably going to be around about a six or an eight millimeter. So here are the trays delivered in 2016. Now, one of the things we were doing, he was part of a study, and we were actually evaluating the bacteria that were present. Again, your gram-negative obligate anaerobes were the predominant species at the beginning of treatment. Within one month, you have almost eradicated, at least reduced the number of those bacteria to log two to four. 
and you've replaced those with less virulent bacteria. So what we're doing is we're replacing the pathogens with more symbiotic or commensal bacteria. As a result, he starts to notice improvements in his conditions. Here he is at six months. Now, we've modified him from four times a day. He's now utilizing the system twice a day. We're going to, in, we're going to include utilization of salt water, and I'll show you in a, a few more slides why, and that's because of the effect this has with the polymorphic nuclear leukocyte. But you can see the progress that has been made for this gentleman, and all he's doing is oxygenating his pockets. Then we go in, yes, there'll be some subgenual calculus and tartar. We can then use the perio trace to deliver a topical analgesic so that we don't irritate the tissue. Then my hygienist can go in, clean out any of the calculus, tartar, et cetera, continue to use the trays. As a person begins to heal from these huge pockets, the trays won't fit as well. So most of your patients, especially ones with this severe case, are going to need a second set of long-term maintenance trays. So here we are at eight months. He's been using the prescription trays. We're down to all pockets are less than three millimeters. He's now using the trays just when he bathes or shower. He's using hydrogen peroxide, but we also added a medicament, vibromycin. Now, vibromycin is doxycycline hyclate, and it has two primary usages. The first use is to help stop the inflammatory matrix metalloproteinases <clears throat> excuse me, chemokines and cytokines. The second use is augment bone regeneration, which is that fourth step in the guidelines of a chronic wound treatment. And vibromycin allows you to do that. So how, what difference does this make for this gentleman? Here he is at two years. All the pocket probing depths have gone down. You can see the results from 2015 to 2018. He's gone from six, seven, eight, nine, 10 millimeter pockets to the deepest pocket he has is four millimeters. <clears throat> also, if you notice where he started with the bite wings, the bone loss that was present on the mesial buckle of tooth number 15 is now filling back in with new bone. And this is because of the effects of the doxycycline, because it inhibits osteoclasts, so you stop your bone loss, while it augments or accelerates your osteoblasts so that you increase your bone regeneration. Now, how does that do it? How does it work? Well, let's look at the research that we have on doxycycline. If you look at Donahue's work, what Donahue found is that when you introduce doxycycline or any of the tetracyclines to the bone osteoclast interface, what the doxycycline does is it bonds to extracellular calcium ions and it bonds to intracellular calcium ions. For an osteoclast to attach to bone, it has to make a covalent bond between an intracellular and extracellular calcium ions. If you occupy either or both of those ions, the osteoclast cannot attach to bone. And if the osteoclast can't attach to bone, it moves off the bone. And what Donahue found is that 96% of the osteoclast detach from bone. Said another way, if you use doxycycline locally delivered, you're going to inactivate 96% of your bone loss. Well, you and I both know we have osteoclastic precursor cells, so you're just going to make new osteoclasts. You just postponed it. You kicked it down, kicked the can down the road. Well, take a look at Holmes' work. What Holmes was doing was he was looking at osteoclastic precursor cells making new osteoclasts. 
And what he found was if you introduce doxycycline, what doxycycline does is it completely abrogates, totally stops the formation of new osteoclasts. So if you have 96% of your osteoclasts detach and you form no new osteoclasts, what have you helped your patient do? You have helped your patient stop their bone loss. If you don't have osteoclasts that are active, you don't have bone loss. So for the first time, we now have verifiable proof that you can stop bone loss. Well, yeah, but what effect does the doxycycline have on osteoblasts? Well, we know we can stop this bone loss, but what happens as far as bone regeneration? Well, take a look at Malari's work. Malari was doing similar work to Holmes, and he was looking at osteoclastic precursor cells giving rise to osteoclasts. He found the exact same thing. You introduce doxycycline. What doxycycline does is it stops your osteoclastic uh, formation, but then when these are no longer made, what he saw was your osteoblastic activity increased to 112%, so you started making new bone. So if we can detach 96% of osteoclasts and form no new osteoclasts, and we can augment bone regeneration, what does it mean? We can regrow bone. We can stop bone loss, and we can restore bone. What was the fourth step in the AMA, ADA guidelines? Augment regeneration. That's exactly what you're doing with this system. You're going to control etiology. That's what hydrogen peroxide does. You're going to debride the wound. That's what hydrogen peroxide does. You're going to cleanse the wound. That's what hydrogen peroxide scale and ruplenin do. You're going to prevent reoccurrence by having the patients use this system on a regular basis. I, I use mine when I, when I bathe or shower in the morning, and you're going to augment regeneration. This system, direct medication delivery, follows step by step the AMA and ADA guidelines for chronic wound management. As a result, this gentleman now has a health he never had before. He's looking at going from deep pockets where scaling and root planing, acute modalities were ineffective in treating his disease. By treating the chronic wound with a chronic wound treatment, he has been successful and he has augmented the bone regeneration around his teeth. Specifically, you can see it real very plainly, around tooth number 15. Now, hyperbaric oxygen, oxygen under pressure, is tremendously effective in treating the periodontal pathogens. Those bacteria that cause most of the damage are gram-negative obligate anaerobes. They are almost totally eradicated within 24 to 48 hours of hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Now, you don't have to use it the whole time because what happens is by delivering the hyperbaric oxygen, you change the microenvironment, and by reutilizing this the tray system four times a day, you keep that oxygen concentration up to a lethal level for your bacteria, your obligate anaerobes, but oxygen under pressure is fabulous for promoting healing. We know that you can inhibit the growth of your subgingival obligate anaerobes, you can promote your periodontal tissue healing, and the results can last for up to two years. All we have to do is be able to deliver oxygen under pressure into that anaerobic environment that exists in periodontal pockets. The second thing that oxygen under pressure does is it stimulates wound healing. In particular, it increases the neovascularization or the development of new blood vessels. Now, you have to use it 
about 15 to 20 times for this to occur. But what happens with oxygen under pressure, you stimulate the capillaries then to go move back into this damaged area and you're gonna be able then to promote the healing. So oxygen under pressure is a tremendous wound healing agent and nobody's allergic to it. Now, another thing that these trays do is they serve as a wound compression appliance. See if I can help you understand this. One of the things that the medical profession has looked at, and this has been around since 5000 BC, is when you have a wound and you get a fluid buildup or an edema, you get all these proteins packed in this tissue. If you don't find a way to remove that fluid, move it out of there, push it back into the capillaries, push it back into the veins, or push it back into the lymphatic system, it impairs healing. So what the medical profession does is they apply compression bandage. And what it is, it's a means to apply pressure to this tissue so that you can push the fluid out. Well, the flanges of these perio trays perform the exact same purpose. They help you manage the venous stasis, the swelling, the edema of this infection so that you push that fluid back into the capillary system, through the capillary system, through the venous system, or into the lymphatic system. When you do that, you get rid of your matrix metalloproteinases, your chemokines and cytokines, that when they build up to too great a level, they impair healing. So what you're doing is the paratray also serves as a wound compression appliance. So what you're able to do, to do then is to control this edema and go from where all the fluid is built up, the trays then fit over this, and they then move those infective agents, those infected agents, out of the region to allow healing to occur. <clears throat> so what you're going to get with the wound compression co concept is you're going to overcome your capillary rupture, you're going to then allow the fluid to go through the lymphatic system. You're going to be able then to get that, those proteins, et cetera, out of that region so that you then can get the process of healing to occur. Now, here's how it works. This lady came into the office a number of years ago. She had profuse bleeding, had 156 bleeding sites. 81% of them were greater than 3.4 millimeters, which means they were all anaerobic. And you can see the tissue response. All the little red diagrams or red um, diamonds are bleeding upon probing. So again, we're going to use the tray. We're going to start her out in accordance to the scope and magnitude of her disease. The deepest pocket determines utilization. We'll use a new tray when the healing occurs and we see that the flanges no longer contact the, uh, the, uh, the tissue as the edema is dissipated. And then we're gonna use those trays long-term to prevent reoccurrence. So what we're doing in a situation such as this is we're allowing the region where the bacteria start, where they build up this infection, where you get the edema and you get the infection, we can't control that mechanically with a toothbrush or dental floss because it won't reach deep enough. We can't remove it with scaling and or root planing, but what we can do is we can deliver a medicament, subgingival and interproximal, and change the area that was conducive to disease to one that is now conducive to health and healing. Putting her trays on, you see the appearance in the beginning. Within four weeks, you can see the tissue changes that occur. You can also see the pocket probing depth changes as depicted on the right side of your screen. What are we doing? We're treating a chronic wound with a chronic wound modality. We're controlling the cytokines. We're controlling the matrix metalloproteinases. 
when you remove those, you remove your inflammatory state and then healing can occur. If you don't get rid of the cause of disease, you can't keep this under control. And that's what happens with chronic wounds. If those bacteria remain, these inflammatory proteins continue to occur. What we know is that with compression therapy, you decrease your inflammation by decreasing your matrix metalloproteinases and your chemokines and cytokines. And that's specifically what this system to deliver medication, subgenital and interproximal, allows. By controlling these tissue matrix metalloproteinases, you decrease the inflammation, and that's what this compression therapy allows you to do with the flanges of these trays. It decreases those inflammatory products. So what the, this system allows you to do is to deliver hydrogen peroxide, periogel, subgingival, and interproximal. You can use the antioxidant properties of doxycycline to control inflammation and augment bone regeneration. It delivers hyperbaric oxygen in about a 5.7 times concentration level. You have a wound compression appliance so that you decrease the edema. You get rid of the matrix metallum, proteinases, your chemokines and cytokines, and then you augment healing to reoccur. By utilizing it regularly, it is a prevention method so that that region is only conducive to health and healing. It is not conducive to the reformation of the periodontal pathogens. Now, one last aspect. Why did we add salt to this, to this process? Well, the human polymorphonuclear leukocyte will, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide and chlorine, will produce ozone through a cholesterol ozonolysis process, which is a completely natural process. It is therefore within the guidelines of the AMA and ADA, it is a naturally occurring situation. You're not having to make a substance and put it into an area. I think one of the reasons that this system works as well as it does is because ozone is a tremendous medicinal agent. What ozone does when it contacts a bacterial surface, because an O3 molecule is so reactive, is it basically disrupts or degrades both gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls and makes holes in them. And the more holes you make, the faster the bacteria die. And that's bacterial lysis, and there's no bacteria that is resistant to this process. What happens is the bacteria that are there before treatment are eradicated after treatment. And the only bacteria that exist on this slide, the scan electron microscopy image, are only gram positive bacteria that you find in healthy gum tissue. You don't need probiotics because the only bacteria that remain are the ones that help the healing to occur. You reduce the number of bacteria by a log two to a log four. So by controlling the bacteria, by controlling the microenvironment, by augmenting regeneration and preventing recurrence, you have a system that allows the patients now to control under your guidance, the microenvironment that was conducive to disease and make it a microenvironment that is only conducive to health and healing. You get a 95 to a 99% reduction of the pathogenic bacteria. And that's what a log reduction is. This isn't rocket science. If you control the cause of disease, if you control the wound healing, if you prevent reoccurrence and you augment regeneration, you are following chronic wound guidelines. All right. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer those for you. So if you have any, go ahead and type them into the, the format, and I'll see if I can give you any answers for those. The nice thing about this system is it works. All the offices that are using it, utilizing it, all are getting the same results. The research shows 
You control those bacteria that cause disease. You do not have problems with the regeneration of the pathogenic bacteria. What you end up with is you end up with bacteria that are only conducive to health and healing. What is the concentration of salt? What I tell patients, we give them a, a one ounce eyedropper, which is the smallest eyedropper you can find. Half ounce is fine. We tell them to put one eighth of a teaspoon of regular iodized salt. Not, you know, it's, this is just regular table salt. It's not your uh, sea salt or anything like that. You want the iodine in it as well. And you mix that, you just fill up that half ounce to one ounce, and then they put one to two drops of the salt water in the perio tray. How long do I have the patients use the vibromycin? Uh, I have the patients use the vibromycin as long as there's inflammation or as long as there is a reason to believe that we can still get more bone regeneration. It's because there's two purposes for the vibromycin, to control inflammation. So when bleeding is gone, when you see the stippling starting to return, you've controlled the inflammatory process, but if you're using it for bone regeneration, then what I have them do is I have them use that for, uh, for as long as we need to do that. What are, okay, how much solution to put in the trays for the teeth? We put in the trays the smallest amount of gel that you can put into the tray. We make a small beading that, so it will go throughout the entire tray, but you do not need more than three drops of the vibromycin. And the vibromycin comes from Pfizer. Um, you can get it at any pharmacy and you only need three drops per tray and again you may only use that once a day or twice a day depending upon how much inflammation is there and what healing needs to occur at what type what point do you start root planing in our office we usually start root planing at about two weeks what we have found is at the end of two weeks of using these trays you have eradicated about 95 to 99% of the bacteria. So what we wanna do is control the cause of disease first so that when we go in there, we don't in increase any bacteremia. Okay, what are, the hydrogen, what are the hydrogen peroxide gels that we use? They're a perio gel, and you can get that information from Perio Protect if you'd like. Um, they can certainly give you that. Let's see, is the tray made in the lab or in the office? These trays are medical devices. There are five laboratories in the United States that are cleared by the Food and Drug Administration. These are FDA cleared medical devices. Uh, so they have to be made in one of the laboratories. There's also a code for those, which is D5994 but those have to be made in one of the laboratories that's cleared with the Food and Drug Administration to, um, to make those trays. How often do I scale a root plane? Well, if that question is gonna depend upon how fast the patient regenerates calculus and tartar. But the good thing, the thing you, you, you also love about this, hydrogen peroxide changes calculus to material alba because it disrupts the protein that holds the calculus together. So instead of having that hard barnacle type of calculus, you have a much softer material, which also means if your patients will use these trays before they brush and floss, brushing and flossing will also help remove these a little bit better. Does this stop the need for perio surgery? No, not necessarily. Certain of these bacteria, there are about 15 that we know of, uh, PGAA are the two most common, FM. They have the ability to invade human epithelial cells. Once they get inside the human cell, they move from cell to cell to cell to cell to cell. That infected tissue would have to be removed surgically with a laser, with cold steel, electrosurgery, whatever you're gonna use. How do you know that that's there? 
you're going to have a patient that has two eight millimeter pockets. One eight millimeter pocket is going to go eight seven six five four three two one one two one two one two. The other is going to go eight seven six five 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 five. And if you look at the X-ray, you'll almost always see a vertical bone loss. That's pretty much to a giveaway that you may have some granulomatous tissue. You numb up just that one area. I have not done a quadrant surgery in, oh gosh, probably 20 years. Don't need to do quadrant surgery. You do site-specific surgery. Is a gel with vibromycin also dispensed through Paraprotec? Uh, no. The, the vibromycin itself, you have to get through a pharmacy. The Perogel, yes, you can get that through Paraprotec. Can we inject hydrogen peroxide syringe around the sulcus instead of the trace? Sure, that's how I started. What I tried to do in the beginning was I would put this stuff in little syringes and I would just go down and I'd exude it down into the periodontal pocket and I'd watch it just get flushed right back out. Um, there's some research that shows with an infected sulcus, that sulcus volume changes about every 15 seconds. So having hydrogen peroxide and putting it down there and having it pushed back out in 15 seconds just won't get you where you need to go. Sure, you can put it in there. It just doesn't stay there. Okay, a uh, question was how does, you, how do you make enough pressure to deliver this, this medication, subgingival and interproximal? That's a good question. The seals around the trays seal so that as the hydrogen peroxide breaks down to water and oxygen and generates 5.7 times the oxygen saturation, that builds up pressure. Or when the patient bites on the tray, that also builds up pressure. Because the seals fit so tightly around the teeth, the only place that pressure is going to be exuded is interproximal and subgingival. So what it does, and, and this was part of the, the, the clearance for the Food and Drug Administration, we had to show them that we could deliver a dye with this system up to the apex of seven, eight, nine millimeter teeth. Does it regenerate bone around an implant? If you go to PerioProtect, we had a whole mastership series on, not only do you regenerate bone around teeth, but you can also regenerate bone around implants. And yes, you can also control it around, in, in, uh, around implants as well as the teeth themselves. Uh, vibromycin, you, you can get vibromycin at any pharmacy. If uh, they don't have it, they should be able to order it for you. So that should not be a problem there. Okay, are intraoral scanners capable of capturing? Yes, if you want to take, uh, if you want to scan the complete mouth, you can send those uh, scans into Paraprotect. They will then make the model for you and then they can make the trays off that. But when you send in either your impression models or your scan models, you also have to send in the, um, periodontal probing. And one of the things that is involved with this offer from Perio Protect is that they will offer for you free training. It's a, what, the, what they call a getting started webinar. If you contact Perio Protect at supportofperioprotect.com, they will set up training in accordance with your office schedule, your lunch hour, or whatever's gonna work. They need about an hour and they'll walk you through all the different steps of that. How often do you apply the vibromycin with the paratrace? That's going to depend upon the scope and magnitude of the inflammation or how long do you want to augment bone regeneration. As long as I see a potential for bone regeneration, I have my patients continue to use it probably at least once a day. Okay. The, the question was how these trays actually work. It's because when you send in the prescription to the laboratory along with your probing, what the laboratory is going to do then is they're going to custom make the seals and then they apply those to the, the tray itself. Do you recommend S scale and root plane after the pair of trays? Yes. 
guidelines of chronic wound care, control the etiology of the bacteria first, then do your wound debridement. So what we do is we use the paratrace first, and then at two weeks, we can go in and do scale and root plane. Uh, how to make the paratray? Either what you can do is you can either scan or take the impressions and send either the impressions or stone models in along with the patient's periodontal probing and the Paraprotect lab. And you can get all this information at support at paraprotect.com. And they'll walk you through that with a getting started webinar if you want. If you want. Let's see. Is the tray made in the lab? Yes. Do the cell waste trays in Canada? Yes. There are, I believe, two laboratories in Canada that are cleared to make these perio trays. You can also get the perio gel now in Canada, and I know vibromycin has been there. So yes, these have been available in Canada now for a couple of years. What is reasonable charge for the trays, and what does this fee include? All right. The average cost that most practitioners are using for the uh, perio trays is about 700 in arch. We see anything from $400 per tray up to $1,200 per tray. What most people do is they will take the laboratory cost, and the average laboratory cost is about $100 to tray. They're going to multiply that by whatever it is the multiplier they need for them to make a reasonable profit in their office. If you have a a crown that, that costs you $200, let's say. Your laboratory cost is going to be $200. You're going to multiply that $200, like say by five or six, you're going to charge the patient $1,000, $1,200 for that crown. You do it the same way with paratrace. And the question is, how long do you use the vibromycin? I think a minimum of two weeks. I think you can use it. I have used it since 2004. Um, I use it because I want to be sure that uh, my teeth stay as stable and as healthy as I can. All right, let me see if I can get this question. You said you need a new tray to use after three millimeters of healing. So usually two trays will be needed for most patients. Um, I would think a number of your patients are going to need two sets of trays. If you have a patient that has 10, 12 millimeter pockets, they may get the three sets of trays, but those are really severe cases. I'd say most of them are going to get by with one or two sets of trays. Do we have access to the presentation after today? Yes, I think that this presentation was uh, recorded, and I think that uh, if you go through Catapult, they can get that for you. Do most insurances cover the perio trays? Uh, there are codes now, and we see more and more of the insurance companies uh, honoring D5994 on an ongoing basis. So if they're not, continue to send them in because every, every week we hear of another insurance company that's picking these up. How often do you apply the salt solution? Probably once a day. <clears throat> You could use it every time you put it in. Some of our patients will do that. Uh, you're not going to be harming anything by putting one or two drops of salt in there with it. What labs do make the paratrays? If you go to support, well, you, what you can do is just go to paraprotect.com. And on there, there will be the listing and the information for the labs. or you can just email support at paraprotect.com and they'll tell you the names of the laboratories. There's um, Great Lakes Orthodontics in Lake Tanawanda, New York. New York. There is Inman Orthodontics in Florida. There is the, the Paraprotect Lab in St. Louis. There is uh, Ohlendorf Laboratory in St. Louis. And there's Space Maintainers in California. Those are the five, uh, five laboratories. How much water do you mix with the 1 8 teaspoon of salt? About half to one ounce. Any issues with recession from thin tissue types? Not only can you control the bone loss, but what you can also do is stop recession. I have a presentation we did on one of the, the mastership webinars 
where we actually showed up to a four millimeters of bone regeneration. Well, as the bone regrows, your recession goes away with it because as the bone level increases, your gum tissue does too. So the teeth go back to a more normal. Now, I'm not gonna tell you you're gonna totally get rid of all recession, but at the very worst, you'll stop it where it is. I fully expect one to, one to four millimeters of regeneration. Okay, can we use over-the-counter hydrogen peroxide solutions? You can. The problem is if it's a solution, you put it in a tray, you turn a tray over, it's going to roll out of there on you. It's better if you use a gel. Uh, see, could you say this decreases the risk for developing Alzheimer's? We know that certain of the periopathogens are associated with Alzheimer's disease. If you take a look at McClossey, Revere, Revere, and Smith's work, what McClossey found was that they did a dissection on patients that had Alzheimer's and they found periopathogens. Revere, Revere, and Smith said, if that's the case, then let's backtrack that. And they found the same bacteria in the periodontal pocket, in the mandibular nerve, the maxillary nerve, the trigeminal nerve, through the trigeminal nucleus, through the hippocampus, through the pons, to the cortex where the Alzheimer's was. Now, I'm not saying that periodontal disease is, is the cause of all the Alzheimer's. It's not. And if it's there, there's nothing you can do it. And these are the, the bacteria were Treponema denticula. Once they get inside the nerve, you can't get rid of them. The whole key is control it before they get there. Uh, let's see, you can you use alginate? Absolutely. Uh, there's no reason that you can't use alginate. What you need to use is whatever is the best in your hands or your office hand. Any recession, how do you charge for, oh, how do you charge for the second set of trays? I charge the same as the first set of trays. If my patient needs two sets of trays to control their disease, the cost for that is X dollars. If my patient needs two crowns, the cost for those two crowns is X dollars. I don't charge less for the second crown if there's gonna be two crowns side by side. If that's the scope and magnitude of the disease, it's my responsibility to give the patients what they need to correct their, their disease process. Uh, what kind of fluoride can we use in paratrace? Any type of gel would work. And if you have a patient that has some sensitivity, putting a fluoride, uh, phosphor, uh, any, of the, any of those gels in the tray, hold it into that in the tray for about half hour. And what you're gonna find is the sensitivity will usually be gone in one to two visits. So yes, there's no reason you can't use fluoride in there. Is this anything like the tetracycline threads? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> When I first started this with my training back where it was all those years ago, I thought it was going to be the antibiotics. The hydrogen peroxide was just to push the antibiotics down into the sulcus. Little did I know it was hydrogen peroxide. I mean, sometimes blind luck is better than good planning. How about topical steroids for lichen planus? Um, there's been some work at the University of Oklahoma uh, Robin Henderson is the head of the, the para department there. And they use uh, Lydex, which is a topical steroid for treating lichen planus. Uh, you can probably get a hold of, of Robin at the University of Oklahoma. I think there's also been an article. You might be able to find that at support at paraprotect.com. Again, any of these questions that you have, go to support at paraprotect.com. Their job is to help you. I want to thank you all very much for this and uh, for your attention, for the time you have taken, for the dedication you have to your patients, and I look forward to hearing your successes.